I'm Andres. I work for Citus Data these days. I'm a PostgreSQL developer and committer, and that's where I spend most of my time. And I'm going to talk about PostgreSQL's buffer manager and which problems it has and what improvements we can make. First off, two questions. Who was in Amit Kapila's talk two slots ago? Okay, significant portion. And who was uh, in the talk about the write ahead log after that? Okay, so good portion. Good. Then I, during their talks, I deleted slides, so <laughs> we don't have to repeat that. So the reason I'm talking about the problems and improvements in the buffer manager is that the buffer manager's design basically is, hasn't really changed very much in the last 10, 15 years. But the world in which we operate, like we have a lot more memory, we have a lot more disk, faster disks, latencies have changed. So there's some aging, I think, in the algorithms that were, that were chosen back then. So I think there's a lot to improve. But on the other hand, even if I say this doesn't work at all or something like that, we are starting at a pretty good place. In, for a lot of scenarios, none of the problems that I'm talking about here will ever be an actual production problem, and re you really mostly hit the issues at the higher end. So I want to very quickly go over the absolute basics that are necessary to, to understand what, we are t what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to go into details about how this works, uh, because that seems like to take about the whole talk. Most cases use shared buffers to uh, cache uh, disk accesses because the disk is slow, even when you're talking about SSDs. SSDs are still a couple of orders of magnitude slower than memory, and that's not likely to entirely change, even if there's now non-volatile memory around and stuff like that. And uh, there's also some correctness issues with where the write ahead lock is uh, only works if we actually don't write data back uh, earlier. That uh, was uh, explained in the slot before. So Postgres uses a buffer mapping hash table to map from uh, which table are we talking about, which block and which table, to a finite uh, list of buffers. And these buffers then contain the actual disk data on, in that block. And it, it, by default, they're eight kilobyte large, you can, but you can recompile them to be differently sized. If you want to read data, what happens is that you look up in the hash table, so you say, do, does, do we have at the moment data in memory for the table so-and-so, block so-and-so? And if there's none, we just use a free block. Let's just assume we have a free block available and lock that block and then read in the data from the operating system. And one very important part is that we actually ask the operating system's page cache. We don't use odirect to directly go to the disk without. We instead ask the OS to potentially also cache data. And if, if the OS hasn't cached the data, it asks the actual storage, then it goes back to the page cache, it, the page cache is, is filled in, and then the data is read in back into Postgres's buffer cache. And after that, we are done. So the writing ca case is a bit different because we only ever write to blocks basically if they're already in the shared buffers. So if, we write, if there's like an insert to a, ta uh, to a row, uh, then we just write that into memory. That means there's no OS interaction here. We just write it into the page that contains the right block. So I earlier said that uh, we just assume that there's a free block, but what if your workload is actually bigger than shared memory? In that case, you have to uh, find free, uh, re replace a block. And Postgres uses an algorithm called clock sweep for that purpose. Uh, it basically is, uh, orders all the blocks we saw as an array earlier into a circle and wrapping around at the last one. And when we need a few, few uh, new buffer that we for another purpose, what we do is we walk around that clock and the clock hand j basically says, we are currently looking at that buffer. And to decide whether uh, to replace a buffer at the cl clock hand, every buffer has a so-called usage count. Initially, and the usage count is a number in Postgres by default, if you, unless you change compilation settings between zero and five. And if we just assume that the buffer two at which the clock hand points right now has a usage count of four, the way it works that is that if the hand points there and we need a replacement buffer, it looks at the usage count, and if it's 
zero, then it directly uses the buffer. And if it's bigger, it just decrements the buffer usage count by one. So it just does this. And after that, we look at the next buffer. And they're the same game. If the buffer usage count is zero, then we use it. If not, we just decrement the usage count. So that continues to tick until we find a buffer with usage count of zero. In that case, I can possibly just use that buffer directly if there's no, if the data in there is not important. But potentially, we've modified the data in that block. In that case, we obviously need to write the data back to disk first, because otherwise we'd lose important data if we just reuse the buffer. So that's the point when writes go, uh, go to disk. The way that works is just that we, again, lock the buffer, and then we ask the OS to write data. But here, important is that, again, we just ask the OS to write to the page cache. We don't directly write to the storage. And the OS decides on its own, basically, when that data is written out. And that actually leads us to the first problem I want to discuss, which is that if you run a, a minimally tuned Postgres on a, uh, on a relatively slow storage device, it's like my home server workstation, and in this case, it's a rotational storage, you often end up with a throughput graphs and latency graphs that look like this. At the beginning, you have a pretty good performance, and then after a while, you get very, very, very spiky performance. You can see that we can do 18,000 TPS when it's okay, and then in between we go basically to one-tenth or something. And the latency spikes. So I've just said how writing out data works. And one important detail to know here is like, you can see that the performance is okay till the 300 seconds. And that's because then, that's when the check, first checkpoint starts if you start Postgres. It starts after five minutes, 300 seconds. So we start to write out data at this point. And coincidentally or not, the increases in, uh, the, the decrease in performance start there. So why is that? If you look at the same time at the stats in the operating system, how much dirty data is in its own, pay, in the OS page cache, you can see something like this. So there's a lot of, uh, there's four or 500 megabytes of dirty data at the peak points. And that's also when things are slow, because the OS every now and then has to decide, I'm now writing data back. And unfortunately, Linux by, Linux by default just says, I'm trying to do this as fast as possible. And that's when all the other writes that we have, have to do, for example, PG Bench, which we, were, we saw the results there for, was, uh, does a lot of small transactions. If the transactions want to commit, they have to make sure that the data goes to physical storage. And that's when we see the delay, because there's so much write back going on when the OS tries to write the dirty data from the page cache onto the disk. So you can kind of uh, work around this uh, in various ways. But if you don't, you can really see latency spikes in a couple of hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, I've seen machines stall for over an hour without anything happening because there was so much dirty data. And whether you are prone to see that problem depends a lot of what kind of workload you have and what kind of hardware you have and how you configure the uh, operating system. The and you will either see that you get these stalls every dirty write back sentence in Linux, which is 30 seconds by default, or you'll see them when a dirty background ratio of memory or dirty ratio of memory is reached, and that's by default 20% of the available memory or 10% of the available memory. And you'll also see the spikes whenever the check, when a checkpoint finishes. And if you ever looked at uh, the lock checkpoints output of Postgres, you can see that sometimes it says the sync of the files took so and so many seconds. And if that's very long, that's usually to blame, this problem. So you can, you can work around this in Linux by just setting dirty background ratio and dirty ratio to very low values. And that can give you performance back. There's also other solutions which we now implemented in 9.6. We can tell the kernel that every, whenever we write data back, hey, we now wrote at a couple megabytes or a couple kilobytes. Please now write that data back, but don't do a full F data integrity write. Just write, flush it out now. And the, the call in Linux is for that a sync file range. In other operating systems, we can use mmap and msync, and there's a bunch of other possible implementations. These are the ones that are OK, performance-wise OK. And that works on Linux, and that works on FreeBSD and OS X. But because it's a bit more expensive, only on Linux, it, this feature is enabled by default. 
But the problem is with optimizations like this uh, that uh, they kind of have a trade-off. If you have a large workload and you write a lot, but your total and th the workload is bigger than shared memory, but smaller than the OS's page cache or smaller than the dirty page uh, ratio, dirty background ratio, then you can actually have the case that by flushing more eagerly, you get noticeable slowdowns because previously we just used the operating system's page cache as, as an extension to shared buffers. We constantly wrote da dirty data to the, the kernel, but it will, we already only wrote data that was already dirty, so the kernel didn't have to, there was no write involved. But if we force the flushes to happen earlier, that can have a performance impact. So that's why you can configure the writes to, that this does not happen, but by in, it's at the moment enabled by default. And if you look at the performance impact of the same workload on the same hardware, this is now how it looks. You can see that at the beginning, the performance is mostly consistently good. This one is actually when my backup tool started doing the uh, test and slowed things down. But after 300 seconds, uh, the first checkpoint starts. And we see that the performance is lower because the checkpoint actually does work. But it's not as low as it was below 200 before. And after another 300 seconds, the checkpoint finishes, or after 300 times 0.9, because that's the completion target, and the performance is good for a short while, and then it's in the middle again. You can get this one, this performance level a lot closer to this one by saying my checkpoints are allowed to take longer. You can increase the checkpoint timer. But one sec. this trade-off with, OK, we can improve the performance if your uh, process is configured correctly but it will, might decrease performance in other cases when you haven't, it's unfortunately pretty fundamental. I think it will be come more and more into play the higher performance you want. Because at some point, the, the, the trade-offs are that you, Postgres does more work and gives less control to the operating system, and that ha means the Postgres has to be configured better. Jeff? Uh, just to add about the latency spike uh, there. Um, That's the F-sync oh, at the end of the checkpoint. Um, I think we can improve on the, that as well. They, I've sent a patch a while back where we do the F-syncs on the individual files whenever we are done with them. Because we now sort checkpoints, we can do the F-syncs whenever we ha did an individual file. That is actually, you have the information for that, or an individual segment, but nobody has done the work yet. But that reduces, makes it more Italy for the rest of the world. So I think that's a good improvement, but it means that you have to tune shared buffers more carefully. So if not, if you can't do that, you need to turn off back and flush after because that's the biggest performance impact. So the next big problem I see is that Postgres uses a hash, hash table for this buffer mapping. We saw that on the first slide where whenever we ask, is this buffer in memory, we ask the hash table and then check, go to the sh buffer in shared buffers. And that's actually performance problematic for several reasons. Some of them are like micro optimizations, others are architectural. Like from the micro uh, optimization perspective, it's actually pretty expensive to do hash table lookups. For one, our, the key for, into the hash table is fairly wide in, po in Postgres because we have to store the database ID, we have to store the table space ID, we have to store the uh, relation identifier and the fork number. And that makes 20 bytes in total. And while we hash that to a small value, we still need to do a mem com compare whenever we do the uh, lookup, because otherwise, obviously, there can be hash collisions. So that actually con is the biggest chunk of work we do for the hash table lookups, often the comparison of the actual key. It's also a problem that hash tables, while they are o one in performance, in the average case, the, they're actually not very good from a CPU efficiency point of view because there's no spatial locality. If you look up block one in a relation and you look up block two afterwards, they're going to be in entirely different parts of the memory. But that's a very common task to look at lo uh, spatially re uh, related blocks. So and you'll have completely independent, independent cache line. So a, a data structure that has spatial locality would be a lot faster. There's also a big problem that uh, hash tables by definition have no meaningful order between, uh, you can't efficiently say, give me the next defined buffer in the relation. Say, I'm looking at block one, give me block two, it's block two already in memory, give me the next block that is in the relation. That's not possible in a hash table because there's no ordering. 
so uh, that is a problem for a number of cases. One of them is, for example, if you drop a table at the moment, we have to scan the whole shared buffers sequentially, which is a problem if it's a couple terabytes, and see whether there's any blocks that we have to throw out of shared buffers. It's also a problem for write combining, but I'll talk about that in a bit. So my solution, my proposed solution, and I actually have a working patch that I'm going to post sometime next week or the next week after, is to split the hash table into two parts. We can, we can say that we want to have uh, one data structure that keeps track of which files do we have actually open and which are present in shared buffers. And this, that's indexed by the table space, by the database, and by the rel file node. And that we can keep open for a long while. And then from there, we can have an entry into a smaller tree per relation, which says, OK, which block is where in shared buffers? And that has the advantage that uh, if you, for example, want to drop the table, you can, you can just walk down that relation and just scan the blocks that can potentially be in that relation. And it also has the advantage that uh, the key into the tree where we do the actual lookups is now only four bytes because the, our block numbers are limited to four bytes. So we have a lot less data to look at for doing the lookup. In my patch, I implement, continue to implement the relation level mapping as a hash table. And, but the lower level, because there's no need to normally to go through all the open relations in, order, in a defined order, we don't actually need to do that very often because we can cache which relations are open in the back end. Postgres has like structures that keep track of which tables look how, and we can keep a pointer there to how does, uh, which, where in shared buffers, uh, shared memory is that relation open. But the lower level tree, per, which is, I kept one per tree per fork of the relation, Postgres has for each relation, you can have like the main data, and then sometimes you have a free space map, which keeps track where we can replace new data. You can have uh, the uh, visibility map. Oh, this one's supposed to be visibility, not FSM. And uh, that keeps track of which tables does vacuum not have to scan. And for each of them, I've kept a smaller tree, and uh, that is then ordered. And I, for that, I used a so-called, uh, yeah, a radix tree. I'm Talk about that in a second. And I also think that the having a structure in, in memory that represents uh, an open relation has actually a lot of advantages. Because at the moment, whenever we do uh, like a sequential scan on a table, or whenever we insert a new block, we have to at the moment to do an LSEQ on the underlying relations to figure out how big it is. Whenever we want to extend a relation, we have to lock the relation exclusively because we don't know where the co another session concurrently also extends the table, and we would potentially overwrite data the other session wants to uh, extend. So being able to have an in-memory location where you can say, OK, these many blocks are actually initialized, and, but I'm extending up to here would be very helpful. Not just for extension, but also for getting, making uh, the shrinking of files more, uh, more efficient at the moment. When vacuum decides I can shrink a table, we have to exclusively lock the table, which is not very good because that, then you can't read anything anymore, you can't write anything anymore. And I think with, if you had a notion in memory how much data is actually initialized, then you could get rid of that. So I think that has architectural benefits as, f as well as uh, efficiency benefits. What I'm imagining to use for uh, the smaller tree f for each relation to index blocks Well, yeah, kind of. You, we would, you would hold a block on the, in the, real, on the last relation, on the block, and then you would just say the in-memory, you d would decrement the initialized up to here uh, variable in memory by one, and then do that for the next block, decrement. So you only need one block level locks, and then after that, you can truncate. And you probably would need a lock that prevents concurrent extension of the file, because that will get hairy, but yeah. Yes, exactly. So what I'm imagining for uh, the tree for, to do the block lookups on the block level is at the moment a radix tree or a bitcrypt tree or something. Uh, 
And basically that works by, if you have, imagining that the block number is a four byte integer, saying, okay, we subdivide it for the individual tree levels, we subdivide the key space into uh, evenly sized chunks until the last part, which can't be evenly sized because there's not that nice divisor for 32 bits that work well in this case. So in this case, I just used six bits for each uh, tree level. And uh, when I want to do a lookup, I can see, okay, the first two by uh, six bits of my bit uh, of my, the block I look up is, I don't know, a three or something. And then I go into the top level tree level and say, okay, I'm looking at the slot three. And from then I know there's a pointer to the next uh, tree level, or let's say one that maps uh, to the next tree level uh, here. And then I do the next for the next uh, six bits. I can do a look up here and then iterate through that to the last block, le uh, to the last level. And at the last level, uh, I then uh, have the block number stored, uh, the number in shared buffers. And that's the, the one of the benefits here is uh, that you have a very limited number of lookups and that is actually relatively pipeline, CPU pipeline friendly because you can start uh, executing stuff for the next block level relatively early. That's this, and it's the same thing that Linux uses. It kind of works well. I tried other data structures so far. The locking overhead of others are, is worse, but yeah. It's the next thing that I actually wanted to mention. So this, both the open relation table and this one have the problem that memory management get, gets more complicated because you can end up having like uh, as many open relations as shared buffers. And for each shared buffers, you only access the last, rela uh, last block in a two terabyte table or something. Then your trees get fairly deep. And I think it's not a particularly realistic use case, but obviously you can't error out. What I'm thinking of doing right now is to basically say I'm just reclaiming memory and throwing stuff out of cache if that happens. And like you can actually, with some trickery, you can do have shortcuts in the tree here. If there's no neighboring pages, you can go like directly from here to here with some, uh, with a bit flex set. So there's some issues here, and generally so far we had a memory structures which are fairly easy because you can predict the size beforehand directly. But that's not necessarily the case if you have like uh, predict how large is the table that open, number of open relations. You don't really want to size that up for number of p buffers that use a, a, a fairly percent, high percentage. So there's some complexity here. I think being more aggressive about reclaiming memory uh, like open relations is the best way here because it's not that interesting of a use case. Nobody has a couple million relations open at the same time and only one block in each. So in this data structure also has the uh, advantage that you can implement locking fairly e efficiently. It's fairly easy to do a uh, lockless upgrade uh, walk reads in here, and even writes are quite possible. There's some issues around uh, how to do. No, no. I'm not saying that they don't have it, but in memory, one block of, oh. It's not about the on-disk situation, nobody cares, that's fine. It's about having one block in memory of each relation and that never changing. So you basically never read the two billionth page, uh, the f two billionth page of each of uh, 100 million row, uh, different tables, that's fairly unlikely. Because, I mean, you don't have that much storage. <laughs> So um, one of the advantages of this type of data structure is that it's relatively easy to implement lock-free reads and even lock-free writes are quite possible. There's some complexity around how to do save memory reclamation if somebody else is concurrently walking the tree. I've looked at three different implementations of how to do that safely in a not, non, not garbage collected language. I am so far have looked at hazard pointers and Robert has had an implementation of that for Postgres. I don't like them very much because uh, they're very invasive in the implementation of the algorithm and the read side overhead is a bunch of memory barriers usually and that's actually not that cheap. I also looked at epoch-based reclamation. That's fairly nice because the, they're fairly easy to implement. Uh, 
but again, the read site overhead is fairly large. I now have an implementation of RCU for Postgres, read copy updates. It's an algorithm to do lock free read sites and how to do delayed reclamation when you can be sure that nobody else can see the memory anymore. And the big advantage is that you don't have to do very invasive changes in each uh, the data structures you're visiting. So I think that's so far the best approach. Unfortunately, it's not that simple to implement and it's fairly complex. So I, I'm not sure whether it's the best approach, but it's the one I came up with. Yeah. What am I doing for time? One second. So the next problem with the buffer manager that we have that I see is that uh, at the moment, whenever you have a workload that is bigger than, sh than shared memory, usually you can see that most of the writes are actually done by backends themselves. Whenever they read something they, uh, that's uh, not in shared buffers, they have to write out another page that's dirty, which is very bad for performance. Because obviously you, you rather want your uh, backend sessions be active processing your query instead of writing out in, uh, independent data. Um, it also has the problem that if you have a lot of backends that do that and they each write out an in, individual block, you end up with a lot of random writes because each backend just writes out a random buffer, a uh, random page, that's not very good. It also makes uh, the management of the dirty data in the kernel, which I showed earlier to be important, rather hard because each backend does ind independent writes. So if you limit, if you want to have a total limit across all backends, you end up with some complex locking or complex accounting. So it, I think it's good if we want to move the processing of write outs more into the background writer, but more about that in a second. Uh, we also have the problem that this cache replacement algorithm, the clock sweep that I talked about earlier, actually scales very badly because in, we had some bad locking around that, that's fixed in 905, but the other problem is that each backend performs the clock sweep. And that means that the individual buffer, like the headers for the buffers, go from one NUMA node to the next NUMA node and back on constantly. Also, we actually, one clock sweep to find a free buffer is really expensive. We potentially have to go around all buffers five times, around all shared buffers five times because that's the max usage count to find a replacement buffer. The worst case is actually a bit worse than that because you can currently can increase the uh, buffer uh, usage count as well. So uh, I don't really have a way to address the second part, but I think we can address the rest and make that a little, little bit, bit less bad by improving the uh, background writer infrastructure we have right now. At the moment, the background writer is designed to uh, help the clocks to make the clock sweep uh, less more efficient and it does so by whenever the clock hand is it basically tries to scan the next couple hundred blocks after the uh, in front of the clock hand and when it finds a dirty p buffer but only if the dirty buffer has a huge count of zero then it tries to write that out in advance the problem with that is that the algorithm basically is not it's not really all that adaptive it tries if you if there's buffers with, a, it has basically tries to always write out a thousand buffers or something. There's some adaptive logic there, but it doesn't really work. It also has the problem that it actually doesn't do, uh, perform the clock sweep itself. It doesn't change the usage counts, which means that you usually have the, the uh, background writer touching all the buffer headers up to here, and then directly afterwards you have the backends that also touch the cache, same cache lines, which then obviously have to bounce between all the different uh, processes or NUMA nodes or anything like that. So what I think we should do instead is basically rename the background writer to a clock sweeper or sweeper or something process and do, actually do the clock sweep in there and do all the ticks here and whenever it finds a free block or finds a dirty buffer and has that written out, then it puts the, uh, the clean pages with a usage count of zero into a ring buffer which then other, whenever another backend needs a page from there, it can go to the end of the ring buffer or the front, depending on how you want to see it, and say, okay, I want one of these free buffers. And uh, it might be that since then the page has been reused and has incremented the usage count again, but okay, then it just goes to the next one. And that's also fairly easy to scale up. If you have one background writer and it can't keep up, you can just increase the number of these sweeper processes by one and 
you can continue to scale that across. And it's also, I think, actually fairly easy to tune that because you can just say, I, my shared buffers is, uh, I don't know, 100 gigabytes. I always want to have 100 megabytes of that available for reuse. And then you can have as many processes trying to make 100 megabytes available. And if there's nothing to do anymore, they can sleep and can be woken up with a latch. And they will just continue filling up that ring buffer until uh, more than the high watermark of buffers are filled. So, and if that shouldn't work, we can still fall back to the normal clock sweep in the back end. So I think that's a fairly sane approach. I posted a patch in a di another thread a couple months back, but I plan to submit that as a proper thing. And I think I see very little reason not to go for a model like this, but I don't know whether other people have a different opinion. No, the, the clock sweep you can still do through all shared buffers. You don't need to look at inside the individual trees because shared buffer still is an array okay. that, I mean, like if you look, think back to the in, initial slide, the hash table already was there. It's always pointing into the uh, buffer and uh, the area of shared buffers. So that okay. shouldn't be affected at all, except for the case that you might remove the last buffer that a, paid, uh, that a relation had cached, and then you might need to remove that from the open relations table, but that's, I think, the only interaction. And there's also the problem at the moment that whenever we do writes by the background writer or by individual backends, we, we write a random page essentially because we just chose one of, somewhere in shared buffers without any closeness logic or anything and write that back to the disk, uh, to the operating system. That means usually, all the writes done by backends and by the background writer are entirely random. And even on modern SSDs, uh, random writes are really bad in performance. Usually, if you have larger writes and on a good SSD, you can scale up the, if you increase the size of an individual write, it scales nearly linearly to a significant size of write. So uh, it would be good if we were, were able to efficiently say, okay, I'm writing back an individual block is are any of the neighboring blocks also dirty? So, and that's where the radix tree comes in again, because we now have a data, if we implement that, we have a data structure that efficiently is able to look into both directions, are there any neighboring writes? And then you can say, okay, I found neighboring writes, and uh, I can combine these and do it, them as la long, one, either cons small consecutive writes, which then can be uh, combined in the sub IO submission queue of either the operating system or the uh, as a storage device, or what you could also do is use pwrite, which is a, a, per, a system call that allows you to submit non-contiguous writes as a contiguous block, uh, non-contiguous memory buffers as a one contiguous write. Uh, I very, very quickly hacked this together to do writes of up to 16 blocks together, and I got a 40% uh, performance improvement on a uh, bigger than memory uh, PG bench workload, which I think that obviously was really just hacked together, but that seems fairly pr promising to me. And like, uh, if you, the most interesting part was how much that reduced the IO weight you saw on the storage device. After that, we hit some other bottlenecks somewhere in Postgres. So we also have the problem at the moment that the clock sweep algorithm, unfortunately, actually does a lot of work, but doesn't really work that well, because in many workloads, you have that many accesses to buffers, and whenever we access a buffer, we increase the usage count, that you end up with a lot of buffers that have the highest usage count. And then the clock sweep comes and reduces all of the usage counts to zero, so all of them can be reused, and then after a short while, everything has five again, and that, that way there's no actual info benefit of the usage count anymore. And you need a specific usage, uh, uh, usage pattern to generate that, but it's unfortunately pretty common ones. Essentially, at the moment, this always, it only works if your replacement rate of buffers is higher than your access rate. 
And that might be because we implement clock sweep in a bit awkward manner. Uh, but there's different theories why that is. It's also, we can't easily just say, okay, we just, because of that problem, increment, uh, increase usage count to have a maximum of 100 or something, because that means our clock sweep now has to potentially go around the clock 100 times, which will make performance not very good either. So we need to do something about that. One of the solutions uh, I was thinking about is to make the usage count increment differently. We can very cheaply go from one to, uh, from zero usage count to one, and then from one to two. But after that, either use a probabilistic thing, say, okay, from two to three, it only, you need more, have a 10% chance of increasing, or 50%, and then uh, decrease that, which will mean that we only still need the same number of clock sweeps, but we need a lot more accesses to increase uh, to a usage count of five, which means our recency information will be better. I haven't implemented that, but I would be very curious about uh, how that goes. And it shouldn't be very hard, I think. Would that, would that be very different from just raising the five? <laughs> it would, because we, then we don't need, uh, at the moment, we only need maximum five clock sweeps, uh, like full clocks around, uh, which if we implemented to 100, we need to 100. That's I guess you could definitely have clock sweeps. Yeah, but then you have no benefit. No, the, the point is that you need want a nonlinear uh, growth. So, so well, it, or nonlinear. Uh, it doesn't matter. I, I think you could do it on that. Basis. Yeah. Okay. So another uh, idea would be to replace the go away from clock sweep. Unfortunately, all there's not that many very good algorithms out there that are actually applicable to have a couple terabytes of memory under, because a lot of the research in this was made in the 1980s and stuff. And like, oh yeah, we have a couple thousand buffers. Okay, whatever, that doesn't really apply to the current world. I hacked something together using list-based LRUs. And the locking around that gets very complicated because the list manipulation you uh, makes, you need very dirty hacks to be able to insert into the middle of lists to avoid the hotspots at the beginning at the end of the list. So it's not that easy. At the moment, um, Heike basically commented recently that random replacement would be better than what we are doing today because it's actually cheaper. I implemented that and it actually did perform better, which I found very, very sad. For PG bench, uh, random replacement is more efficient than what we are doing today. I mean, yes, so PG bench is not a very good benchmark because it accesses data in a uniformly distributed random manner. So I don't think that's universally true. That's why I'm not suggesting we seriously go there. But at the moment, for some use cases, we have a very expensive implementation of random replacement, which is not very good. Uh, we, no, this was a hack on a flight across the pond somewhere. <laughs> I didn't have any internet, so <laughs> I needed to make do. So we also have the problem at the moment that uh, we interact weirdly with the kernel page cache, more than just that we have the problem that the dirty data is not written back uh, early enough or at the wrong time. We also have the problem that at the moment, in many cases, you will have double buffering. We will have the data once in shared buffers and once in the OS cache. Sorry, you skipped the one that was most interesting. The, the, what's that? Oh yeah, uh, I implemented that actually, sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, but it performs horribly if you have a workload that actually is mostly cache resident because you do clock sweeps on uh, buffer accesses and that's like four orders of magnitude more expensive than uh, the actual pin buffer. And lots of workloads are really, re I mean, we just made the uh, pinning and unpinning of buffers lock uh, free for a good reason because it is an actual contention point. If you then are start accessing the ca neighboring cache lines from all sessions at the same time, the performance goes down. It, I mean, like, I used it on a two-node two neural machine, and, like, I basically, Is it's... Is that something we should fix, like, using the usage count to a different I don't think so. I mean, that will mean we access two uh, cache lines for every pin buffer. That will just make things worse. I don't think it's a... There is a reason why we didn't implement that, and that's because it's too inefficient. I would be very interested if you can come up with an implementation that doesn't have that problem. Um, please do, but I, I don't think it's feasible. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, where was I? Yeah, at the moment, if you have a workload with a lot of reads and your share buffer is smaller than half of the operating system's uh, page cache, then you end up with most of the time have one copy of the page in the OS cache and one another copy of in the in Postgres. And one solution to that is to just set uh, shared buffers to something higher, but that doesn't work well if you also have like queries that need a lot of memory. Or if you want to alive add memory or want to shrink memory, all that doesn't really work with that. So I think we'll end up at the point where uh, just keeping all the data in kernel buffers and in our own buffers is not that feasible anymore. The, the more the, our memory sizes increase, the more problems the kernel page has, has as well. There's a lot of scalability problems there. They have to be a lot more generic than we have to do. So there's, a good, there's good reasons why it would be better to potentially keep that in, make that our problem instead of the kernels. Unfortunately, a lot of the solutions uh, for that are not very nice. One of the relatively easy to implement ways would be to just hint the kernel whenever we've written something. Oh yeah, forget about that, right? and remove it and whenever we have read something also say, yeah, kernel, please forget about this page. Unfortunately, that doesn't really help make any use of the page cache anymore because we then uh, can't, uh, if we forget about a page in memory, then it's also forgotten on disk uh, in the OS page cache. So the current effect of making the page cache as a, a read-only extension of shared buffers doesn't work anymore. So there's a dirty hack which I talked about to some Linux guys uh, that we could say, this is right, but please don't write, actually write it back to storage. And that sends up the kernel page cache. But unsurprisingly, they're a bit hesitant about adding that feature because that means you can arbitrarily corrupt the page cache, which I kind of understand why they don't want that. <laughs> but yeah, that is one solution. Sorry? Yeah. The problem is that that basically also requires co explicit configuration, and the benefit of having using the US page cache is that it's adaptive. So I think it's like I don't know whether that works well enough. It's certainly worth. Uh, thinking about and playing around with. Um, the other solution is to just do all, basically most of the I.O. we do with odirect, and odirect is a flag that tells the kernel to bypass the OS page cache, so every read directly goes to storage, every uh, write directly goes to storage, and usually that path is a good bit faster for the individual reads, because it has to do a lot less, and also has been optimized by other big database vendors, and, uh, but it has a lot of problems too because we would need to improve a lot of, on our perform side because we relied on the kernel. At the moment, if we do a write to the kernel, we can basically expect that to take as long as a memory copy takes plus some uh, state management in the kernel. But after that, we would, every write would take as long as your storage device takes to write something. So suddenly, writes become synchronous, and so far they've been asynchronous. We've started to do work to make do with that. For example, the uh, the sweeper process I just talked about earlier would address that to some degree because it would now move all the writes to the background, but they would still be synchronous. So we probably would either need a lot more of those, or we would need to use asynchronous I/O. But asynchronous I/O, there's all implementations of asynchronous I/O suck. So it, it's hard. And it has a problem that I just mentioned that if you go there, there's no more adaptivity of uh, using, setting a small shared buffers and rely on the OS to uh, be adaptive and use them. Potentially we need to be, make shared buffers more easily replaceable. Perhaps we need to be able to say, okay, this part of shared buffers we are not using efficiently, give, uh, say, mark it as unused and allow the OS to reuse the pages that actually is possible in several operating systems. I don't really know what the best uh, answer to that is. It also has the problem that every operating system needs nearly entire Im independent implementations to be halfway efficient. Something you do on Linux works not at all on Solaris, does not work at all on Windows, 
so there's our, the overhead in uh, us maintaining Postgres will increase considerably. Yeah, I think that's largely because of the dirty right thing I just mentioned. And, and I think we have, I've, like the, pat, the feature I mentioned earlier with keeping track of how many much dirty data uh, the kernel has was mainly motivated by managing latency. We've seen latency reductions by three, four hundred percent. I agree. I just saying like we've made it a little, little bit ba less bad, but the problem is still there. Because the, the reason, main reason for that is that every, whenever you do the syscall, you have the potential more, much, are much more likely to be scheduled out. And that doesn't exist if you don't do a syscall. So, yeah. Um, that actually is my last slide. Any questions? So one up so the question is basically if you have uh, operations that uh, uh, access a lot of data but that don't use our ring buffer we have ring buffers for sequential IO but they are not used for uh, index accesses and how what are the potential optimizations and whether we can use adapt the clock sweep algorithm for that I think to a large degree that might actually be addressed by improving the recency information because of this problem that we if you do a single index lookup, you usually end up with like three, a usage count of three already. So that already destroys a lot of the recency information because like we end up like touching a single index page multiple times. So I think the first uh, improvement would be to improve like the user count management. Um, I have some doubts about the second clock hand being really useful. I don't know. There's a bunch of papers that have ideas like that. I'm a bit doubtful. I think what might be useful to be add a, to say, to tell your session, you always use a ring buffer for the access independent where they are, like we call them bulk access strategies. So you can declare, in, if you do a bulk operation, I also want to keep track of indexes and keep the ring buffer size across several relations at the same time instead of one per relation. I think there, that might be a viable approach to improve on that. Yes. I mean, we, we already have like uh, small ring buffers for sequential access. So if you do a copy, a vacuum, a, select, a sequential scan of a large table, uh, then we use a ring buffer if it's more than fourth, one fourth of shared buffers. I don't know who came up with that. But uh, so we already have, <laughs> we already have uh, some of that, but I think we might be able to make that more widely used. Other questions? Okay, cool.